All right, we're going to be talking about bacterial unknowns, which is what we're going to be doing next week and starting through the rest of the semester for the microbiology labs. Um, first things first. What we're going to be doing is a lot of talking on day one. Um, go any, over any general questions you have your TAs. Um, and, and it's a good time to ask them for questions if you're unsure about something or not sure about what to do, because this is the most important part, because this is bacterial samples that you'll be using throughout the entire semester. And there are no replacements, so make sure you know about those. Uh, we'll also be doing something else day one, which is rapid immunological tests. Um, what these are, in case you guys don't know, they're pretty much just a way of manipulating uh, immune cells or immune products, immune system products, to leverage their high binding ability to determine if somebody's ill with a disease. That's a very vague, I know, statement, but just follow me with it. Um, the very first one, the one that we'll be using a lot in lab, is this thing called lateral flow amino assay. Um, it's basically what we call an ELISA test, uh, which is an enzyme-linked uh, immunosorbent assay. Um, what it's doing uh, was well, the first one was proposed by biophysicist Rosalind Yallo and the physician and uh, endocrinologist Solomon Burson. That's them there. I think they won like a $30,000 grant, which was a huge amount of money at the time when they made it. Um, but basically, here's what it did uh, it was used to determine insulin levels in blood, uh, major, uh, essentially a major advancement for diagnosing, uh, diagnosis, diagnosing diabetes mellitus. Previous methods, which were really inaccurate or indirect was like analysis of urine. One of the early ones was just tasting it to see if it was sweet. Um, further ones were things like little blood tests that were not as accurately, you know, not as accurate and required a lot more testing and labor and were more complicated. This one was just really easy to do, really fast to make and could be done and stored for a year, like a year. Like it's, it was very robust, really easy to do. Anybody could be taught to do it even at home. So it's a very cool little methodology. So let's talk a little bit about what this is. In this case, we're going to be using a very similar test, but we're going to be using it to determine if there is strep. So you've probably had a strep test before. So we've got a sample with some gas antigens here. Um, so we're going to mix them around with our antibodies uh, in a little tube, and then we're going to stick a lateral flow device in there. So just a little sorbent strip of paper and on that it has embedded anti-gas antibodies and anti-IgG antibodies embedded on the strip. This represents the test section and this represents the control section of the test strip. All right so we mix them together what's going to happen as they mix together these guys are going to kind of congeal together and bind uh, the antibodies will be specific to something that's only present, uh, present in group A strep, so it'll bind to that portion of it. When we allow them to mix and suck up through the paper, they're going to eventually run into the test antibodies, and the test antibodies are also against the gas antigens, so they will stop a portion of these antibodies in the middle here, and now you've got a bunch of these labeled antibodies stuck right on this line that have also bound the gas antigens. Now, the other antibodies that haven't bound the gas antigens, because we put a bunch in there, they're just going to move on along down into the control. And the control line has anti-IgG antibodies, so they bind other antibodies. And now you'll have a little line developing right where the control line is, so that you know the control work, that the test is still valid. So what you should see in real life is something like this. While the liquid's being sucked up, if you've got a positive result, you're going to have two lines. The control line is shows up, but you did, more importantly, the test line shows up. The test line always has to be below the control line because you can never tell if it's already gone all the way up to the top line. So we always put the control at the top. That way we can be sure that the liquid has always flowed up fully to the control. Here's a negative result. You can see there's no test line, but the control line is popped. If we have something that looks like this, we call these invalid results. We don't use them, so just keep that in mind. Missing control lines, big issue. The other type of test we're going to do is this one called latex bead agglutination. It's actually really interesting. We bind things to latex beads, and they will clump up if the thing that they are designed to find 
um, are present in the solution. So in this case, we have ones that have IgG antibodies, and then these aren't antibodies against anything. They're just IgG antibodies, and we have fibrinogen. And we're going to mix them with a sample, and they're going to detect Staphylococcus aureus species. If you have Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus has a special protein that will bind onto IgG, and it will start breaking apart and activating fibrin to coagulate it and basically make this nice little mesh that kind of sticks everything together. So if it's positive for Staph aureus, it's going to form these big clumps. If it's negative, everything will stay nice and suspended. And when you guys actually mix this, you'll put the liquid down on the test region paper first. It'll stay this kind of hazy red color. You'll mix up the sample. And if it's negative, it's just going to stay that hazy red. It's going to be evenly distributed. Nothing bad will happen. It'll just stay evenly distributed. If it's positive, it's going to start making these big little clumps, these little dark splotches on the test region. And that way you know that it's positive. So... What you guys are going to do week eight, day one, is you guys are going to do an immune test. Uh, you're going to do this by group. You guys are going to get a couple of drops of tube A and a couple of drops of tube B into a little tube. And you're going to then take a swab that's got a mystery sample on it. You're going to swirl it around in there, give it a nice swirl back and forth. And then you're going to stick a test strip in. And the test strip will suck up liquids and it will show two lines for positive and one line for negative. For the immunobased uh, assay for the latex beads, you're going to add in a couple of drops of the liquid. You're going to mix it around with a little toothpick from whatever sample we have. And then you guys will see a nice clumping if it's positive. Now this takes a little bit of time, about 45 seconds, but sometimes it's much faster. We're also gonna have you guys do a control one as well so you guys can see what the normal uninoculated control looks like. Um, these are actual picture examples here so you can see it's evenly distributed on this one, so this one's negative. This one has those little clumps, those little splotches. That means it's positive. Now, also what you guys will be doing is you'll be starting your unknowns. For the unknowns, we'll give you a sample. The sample will be mixed for Bio 4102 and an individual organism, single broth, for Bio 1102. Um, for Bio 4102, you guys are going to be doing a little gram stain and as well as 1102. Okay. You will then take your sample and you will streak it out on a nutrient TSA as a streak for isolation, as well as a PEA plate and a McConkie's auger. Remember, these two are selective, one for gram positives and the other for gram negatives. You will then grow those and try to identify uh, if it's gram positive or gram negative. For those of you with mixed cultures, uh, you're going to have to do a little bit more work here to determine which one's which. You will then take from these pure colonies that you've gram and confirmed and put them on a TSA slant, and then you'll use that slant for everything else. Uh, you want to confirm that the slants are in fact pure, so keep that in mind. That will be a task that you'll have to do later on uh, in the future. So what will it look like? Week 8, day 1, you guys will get your unknown mixture or single. You guys will then streak them out on plates after you do a quick gram stain. On week eight, day two, you will then take from these plates and then you guys will do a gram stain on them. And then once you confirm that they are pure cultures, you will then streak them onto a TSA slant. For Bio 1102, you'll only get one slant because you only have one organism. For Bio 4102, you'll have two slants because you have two organisms. And then you'll want to confirm the things growing on that slant once it inoculates and grows that you have a gram stain to verify that it's in fact a pure culture. Now, what do we do after this? Well, just to give you a preview, which we'll talk more about later, uh, for week nine, day one, we'll then give you guys some example organisms. So you can do a slide catalase test. And if that's positive or negative, you will do a selection of gram positive identification tests. Um, we'll talk more about this in a bit, but each one has a different kind of setup in it. For week 10, day one, um, we'll have you guys mix your plant into a suspension, and then you guys will put them into um, these little trays that are a Microgen or Rapid ID1 test panel kit. And we'll talk about that more in a bit, but you'll put them in there if you have gram negatives and then you'll do the tests and fill them up with reagents to verify what the result is. Um, then after that, we will give you guys your actual unknowns to do these tests with. So you guys will actually sit down and do these tests. 
pretty simple. If you're gram positive, you'll do the gram positive test. If you're gram negative, you'll do the gram negative test. If you have both, you'll do both tests for your organisms. And then after that, we'll do some uh, PCR and gel electrophoresis, as well as some bioinformatics stuff later on. We'll get to that later as it comes up, just a little preview of what's going to be happening. Okay, so our cool science thing of the week. We save it for the end, best for the end. Um, Ebola test. Ebola is really hard to diagnose. It requires a lot of work. And the problem is, is that our current ELISA tests, our immunostrip tests, are not very sensitive. And they tend to break down over time. And one of the things that we wanted to try is using nanozymes, which are small particles that have an enzymatic ability to them. They catalyze certain reactions. So we can attach them to antibodies. So this is a gold one that we usually use. Not very clear, not very strong signal, but we've talked about using these other ones, which are ferromagnetic um, nanoparticles that have an enzymatic reaction. And by monitoring a reaction, because each of these nanobeads can make a much larger signal based off of a chemical reaction it can do, it's much, much easier to detect it. Also, early detection is very important for Ebola virus detection. Uh, somebody is symptomatic if they have about uh, 7,000 particles. Uh, these are called plaque forming units because of how they do this, but plaque forming units per mil. The detection threshold for nanozymes are about 240 plaque forming units per mil, which is so much lower. So you can get early detection on this. Now, when we look at this uh, with the gold ones, you can see that if we have a very low concentration of the Ebola virus, it just does not show up in the test region at all until you get to 100 nanograms per mil. It just barely shows up. And then it's really strong when it's out of 1,000. So somewhere between 100 and 1,000 is that test range. But if we look at these colloidal uh, suspensions with the nanoparticles, because it's a chemical reaction, even a small amount of it creates a much higher signal. So we can detect it even right here. I would say you could actually probably detect this signal right here. Um, they did an actual optical density thing and they said, hey, look, this isn't statistically significant, even though I think it probably is. We could probably make it a little bit better. But one nanogram per mil or 0.1 nanograms per mil, that is a very good test range. So if you think about that, it's so much faster to be able to diagnose this that it is crucial for us to be able to utilize this rapidly and easily. Um, and because these tests are so easy to use, it presents a really good opportunity to help stop outbreaks of Ebola in the future. So there you go, that's our, our cool science theme of the week. All you need to take away from this is that we were attaching uh, nanoparticles to create a nanozyme that create a much larger signal for the same, you know, such a much bigger bang for your buck compared to the normal gold colloidal colorations. So there you guys go. All right, have a wonderful weekend. I will see you guys next week.